Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Michael Rivero, editor and founder of WhatReallyHappened.com. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you for having me again. A week ago, Canadians elected by majority Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. What's your take on this seemingly very ambitious and friendly young man? Well, uh, I think it was more a question of uh, Canadians wanting to vote Harper out than uh, Trudeau in. Uh, and I think it's the beginning uh, of a period where we're going to see this anti-incumbency, anti-establishment fever sweeping elections, not just in Canada, but here in the United States of America. Uh, I, I think people are, are fed up with politics as usual. And we're, we're seeing it here where the outsiders like Donald Trump, and Bernie Sanders uh, are, are doing extraordinarily well, and the establishment politicians like Jeb Bush are just being hammered to the point where Hillary Clinton actually tried to come on out and claim that she, too, is an outsider, even though she has not driven her own car for 25 years she's, because she's had an unending series of government drivers. I was going to say, and ask Hillary the price of a loaf of bread or, or a carton of milk. Yeah, Absolutely. Is uh, I've called out politicians before. Oh, there's nothing wrong with the cost of living, really. Well, here's some essentials. Do you know what they cost? Yeah, uh, they don't. No, they don't. I mean, they're these are very, very rich people. They're completely disconnected from real life, and I think most voters are going to say we need ordinary people just like us in government, which was the way the United States was set up. The founding fathers never envisioned a permanent ruling class of politician. Uh, the first government of the United States of America was made up of people who had regular day jobs and being in the government was a part-time honor only. What changed it to make them so-called professionals? Well, over time, of course, uh, especially after the Civil War, the federal government grabbed more power to itself. Uh, and uh, once you have the power concentrated in one place, it becomes a giant one-stop shopping center for all the corrupting influences taking off limits to campaign donations basically put the government up for sale to the highest bidder and uh, that's kind of the situation that we're in right now but the original plan for the united states of america was citizen legislators uh, who had their own jobs who knew how to make businesses work knew how to make things they were in the government part-time uh... And most of the power and authority was spread among the people in the local communities in order to forestall corrupting influences. Uh, and certainly the idea that we have these two dynastic families, the Bushes and the Clintons, simply handing the throne back and forth to each other every uh, eight years was never intended by the Founding Fathers. Donald Trump actually kind of fits that bill of the Founding Fathers, uh, but could he and would he put all of his holdings in a blind trust and let somebody else run it? Well, he would have to do that because it is a requirement under U.S. law, but uh, his wealth, I think, is one of the reasons why he is so opposed by both Republicans and Democrats, because we know the, the Bush family fortune is steeped in crime, gun running and drug running, same thing with the Clintons. Uh, Trump has his own money. He doesn't need to sell out to anybody. He achieved his fortune by honest means, and he's not going to be willing to turn a blind eye to a lot of what's been going on in this country. Joe Biden says he's not going to run for president. Is that a blow for the Democrats? Uh, it's certainly a blow for the Democrats who don't want Hillary to be their candidate. A lot of people are wondering just what it was, how Biden uh, was gotten to. His excuse to not run is he doesn't have enough time to mount a campaign. Uh, but American campaigns are already twice as long as any other country. And Biden had already started setting up his campaign machinery in the early battleground states. So it's not like he had not already started to do the work. Fox News had said their sources were saying Biden was going to run. And it caught everybody by surprise when he came out and said no. And Biden may have been, uh, well, Biden was advised by his friend that Hillary was going to destroy him if he came into the race. And I'm sure that Joe Biden knows the real uh, means by which Vincent Foster wound up in Fort Marcy Park. And uh, Biden may have just decided that he wasn't willing to risk, uh, you know, getting the Robert Kennedy treatment to defy Hillary Clinton. Bernie Sanders is leading in the polls in Iowa and New Hampshire, the first states to hold primaries. Does he have a hope against Hillary? Uh, I would certainly like to see Sanders uh, beat Hillary in those early battleground states. Um, we're already seeing Hillary's machine, as it were, 
launching all kinds of smear attacks against Bernie Sanders, and we have to keep an eye out for them and make sure that they don't go anywhere. There's something that people need to remember about Hillary Clinton. Early in her career, she worked for the committee investigating Richard Nixon's Watergate scandal, and so she got an early education in all the dirty tricks that the committee to reelect the president used to sabotage Democrats that Nixon thought could defeat him uh, to guarantee that Nixon ran against McGovern, that Nixon was just able to walk over him. Hillary knows all these dirty tricks, including the ones that were never actually made public. And I have every reason to suspect that she is going to be using every single one of them this next election season. Would Bernie actually be able to bring in health care like we have in Canada? It would be nice. We're seeing a huge growing backlash against uh, Obamacare. Uh, we're now finding out that next year's premiums for Obamacare-compliant health insurance are going to hit 85% increase in a single year. It's been an absolute disaster, both for its overt purpose of affordable health care for Americans for its covert purpose of generating new tax revenues for the U.S. government. That hasn't worked. In fact, it's gone cash negative because Obama is having to uh, just spend millions and millions of dollars on subsidies to keep the Obamacare exchanges uh, afloat, to keep the health insurance companies uh, in business. All of this is a violation of uh, United States law, and the House of Representatives has now brought a lawsuit against President Obama because under U.S. law, revenue measures must originate in the House of Representatives. They cannot originate in the Senate, and they certainly are not supposed to originate on the desk of the president. And so there's a huge constitutional fight building up on that one that is probably going to be keeping Obama busy through most of next year. And, of course, uh, Americans probably aren't familiar with the Canadian health care system. They think it's, quote, free, but we pay medical premiums, but they're very affordable. And it's only basic care, your dentist, prescriptions, eyeglasses, things like that. You still have to cover yourself. You still need private insurers to help cover you. So the private insurance business doesn't go away, but admittedly, it would be much smaller in the U.S. if you had public health care. And by the way, the U.S. is the only major industrialized nation that doesn't have uh, general government health care. And, you know, it's all about making money. Uh, and it began all the way back in the Nixon administration with the creation of the Health Maintenance Organization where it stopped being about the care of the patient and about maximizing profits to the medical industrial complex. And as a result, the United States has the most expensive medical care on earth, and it is ranked poorest in quality among all developed nations. And that's a terrible situation for us all to be in. Uh, we're, we're seeing this rush to mandate more vaccines, uh, some of which don't work, some of which are now acknowledged to cause the diseases that they're supposed to protect against. Uh, they just got around to introducing Western vaccines into Asia, and to nobody's surprise, the rates of childhood autism are exploding everywhere these vaccines go in. Well, as you said, the problem is it's not the individual vaccines. It's like they like to mix, what, up to 33 of them together? Well, it, it's a combination of, uh, of administering vaccines in combination that have never been tested in that uh, uh, situation. The other part of it is that there are adjuvants in these vaccines that intentionally are designed to provoke some kind of harm to hopefully maximize the uh, uh, the immune response. The problem is these are chemicals that are not supposed to be in the bloodstream. Uh, one of the adjuvants they like to use is peanut oil. Well, peanut oil is something that you're supposed to eat and digest, not have injected into your bloodstream. And as a result, it is now thought that the epidemic of peanut anaphylaxis sweeping the United States is due to the use of peanut oil in vaccines. Now, over in Israel, their vaccines do not use peanut oil, and they don't have a problem with peanut anaphylaxis. Their vaccines do use sesame oil, and they have a problem with sesame anaphylaxis. So the linkage is just very, very clear. Uh, we know that there is a problem with mercury-based preservatives, uh, and we unfortunately have a government whose attitude is, as long as it's making money and they're paying taxes, we're going to look the other way. And human health is just not a factor. In fact, if you think about a profit-driven health system, they need everybody to be chronically sick all the time, always be needing prescription medications. If the American people were healthy, this entire corrupted structure would collapse overnight. Is Assad assured to hold on to power now the Russians are attacking all of his enemies, including ISIS? It depends on how desperate the U.S. is to try and reverse Russia's gains in Syria. I mean, certainly uh, we're, we're hearing 
that the battle for Aleppo is going very well for the government of Syria. They've recaptured 150 square kilometers of land uh, around uh, Aleppo. And more than that, Russia has put on display for the world to see uh, all of their weapons that they want to export. And the world is noticing. The U.S. spent a year and $4 billion against ISIS and al-Qaeda. We know that that was a lie, but even those people who are believing that are saying, obviously, the U.S. military isn't everything we've been taught it is. And we're already seeing uh, countries canceling orders for U.S.-built weapons. I understand Trudeau is going to cancel uh, Canada's purchase of the F-35. And we're seeing these countries that used to buy their weapons from the U.S. are now placing orders with Russia. Well, uh, in simulated war games, the Sukhoi uh, jet is so maneuverable, it can take on anything in the world and win. It, it absolutely can, and the F-35 in uh, dogfight uh, testing, uh, evaluation, uh, was beaten by a 1970s vintage American warplane. It can't dogfight. It's uh, electronic systems. Uh, you can't, uh, uh, the, the, the so-called invisible aircraft vision system, they can't get it to work. The software for the cannon won't be delivered until 2019. Uh, the helmet fire control system, which costs $40,000 each, still does not work. And the plane is not in active service yet, and already it's considered the U.S. biggest military boondoggle. Then you have other problems like the F-22, which uh, can't fly as high as it should because it asphyxiates its pilots. The Independence Class littoral combat ships, uh, which are under-armed, under-armored, their electronic systems are wide open to jamming, and they're already having to pull the lead ships of the class back into dry dock to replace large sections of the hull due to corrosion. And we had that incident with the Donald Cook in the Black Sea, where this Aegis ship, which is supposed to be able to uh, detect, track, and engage 90 targets simultaneously, was absolutely shut down by a single Russian electronic warfare aircraft 12 times. And a lot of people are thinking that the real reason the U.S. pulled the Theodore Roosevelt carrier group out of the Gulf area when the Russian ships started showing up is they didn't want a similar embarrassment because America's power projection doctrine is centered on those super carriers. And if those were revealed to be relatively impotent, U.S. power projection would suffer. And there was already an embarrassing incident with the Roosevelt earlier this year during war games over uh, near the Bahamas there was a single French submarine, the Saphir, was able to get through the defensive screen and simulate the sinking not only of the Roosevelt itself, but several of the screening ships. And it was a huge embarrassment. Uh, it was uh, announced in the military media, then immediately pulled back and hushed down. But the world is beginning to see that America's weapons are very expensive and they look very impressive, but they're not very effective. They're very fragile indeed. And a lot of this comes from the way U.S. weapons are put together. They're designed to generate maximum profit for the defense contractors. And there's a very funny book and a very funny movie called The Pentagon Wars. And it's based on the true story of the development of the Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicle. The original book was written by the, the, the guy who's portrayed in the movie. He, uh, he, he's actually a character in the movie about how everybody was saying, let's add on this, let's add on this, I own stock in this company, let's put one of these in there. And it resulted in this hideously expensive, woefully inadequate piece of hardware. And due to politics, they say, well, you have to use it, we don't care if it's junk, you know, you will use it. And it sort of reminds people about this debacle that happened back during Vietnam, involving the debate between the M-16 and the M-14 battle rifle, and the Pentagon brass, who were very heavily invested in the company producing the M14, literally rigged the tests of the M16 to fail. And these were tests carried out in combat. They put the wrong propellant uh, into the bullets so the guns would foul up and jam. So they could say, see, it's no good, we're going to go with the M14. Congress caught wind of it because a lot of kids got killed using that bogus uh, ammunition and having their guns jam in combat. And Congress investigated and found out that that original Armalite design was superior, clearly, and told the military, you will adopt this weapon. And that basic frame of the AR-15 has become the foundation for a whole series of weapons ever since. If you want an armored personnel carrier that can fight its way in and out, why not the Israeli Merkava tank? Well, Israel, not only Israel, Russia and China 
when they spend money to build a weapon, they're trying to build a good, effective weapon. And that's why the U.S. military is saddled with so much uh, expensive junk. I remember some years ago, my wife and I went out to uh, uh, the uh, annual air show uh, over at Kaneohe Bay, and we got to see the Blue Angels and Patty Wagstaff. And we were looking at this Seahawk F uh, helicopter, uh, which is configured for anti-submarine warfare. And we were looking over on the port side, and there was this big, complex looking piece of machinery bolted to the nacelle that actually blocked half of the tubes through which sauna boys are launched. And I was talking to the sonar operator and saying, doesn't this thing get in the way of you being able to do your job? And he said, absolutely. And I said, why is this thing on there? And he says, we were just ordered to put it on there. And that was it. Oh, so... Uh, I do, Dad, that they don't know why it's there and, and what it does, but I bet you it costs a lot. Oh, it costs a lot of money, and it gets in the way of the efficient operation of the platform. The U.S. is sending a task force to the South China Sea. Why? The, this is more saber-rattling, and you need to get back and recall that the ultimate motive for all of these U.S. aggressions is to force the world back onto dependency on the U.S. dollar for cross-border trade and banking, and... Uh, the petrodollar, where all natural resources are traded for the U.S. dollar. And the biggest opponents to that are Russia's ruble and the Chinese yuan, uh, which are refusing to go along with this. And more and more of the world are turning away from the U.S. dollar and using the ruble and yuan for international banking and trade. The only way the U.S. can stop that is to get into a, some semblance of a conflict with Russia, which they're doing in Syria, and some kind of a conflict with China, so the U.S. can go to all of our remaining allies, the few that we still have, and say, see, you can't use the yuan and the ruble, you must use the U.S. dollar. And it's a failed policy, it's still failing, but the U.S. is still out there trying to provoke China over these reefs and atolls that China has built up to make usable land on. And the U.S. position is, you can't just build up an atoll and a reef and declare it to be sovereign property. Uh, and it's an absolutely absurd argument because these land masses are already there. Uh, I mean, here in Hawaii, we've got a new volcano that's south of the Big Island. It's called Loihi. And when it finally pokes through the surface of the Pacific Ocean, nobody's going to question that that is now part of sovereign U.S. territory. Uh, the, the only difference is China's islands are man-made, and our new island that's coming is, is uh, uh, made by volcanic activity. Uh, but again, it's it's another double standard. But the the U.S. needs to get into some kind of a new Cold War against Russia and China to try and keep as much of the world slaves to the U.S. dollar and the petrodollar deal as possible. But again, they're they're losing ground on this one. Well, Stephen Harper tried to use the politics of fear, creating a huge debate about whether women could wear the kneecap, the face covering, covering when they were sworn in as citizens. This involved a total of two women. And he tried to get the whole election base. You can't trust the Muslim because they cover their faces. Well, obviously, the Canadian voters were too smart to fall for that, and they've given Harper and his people the old heave-ho. I'm hearing, I haven't got a confirmation, but I'm, I heard one report, Trudeau may work to repeal Canada's law declaring criticism of Israel to be anti-Semitism. Well, he just wants to bring free speech back to the country. He's going to amend uh, Bill C-51 that basically made free speech illegal. And he says we're going to go through it, see what's needed, if if anything. And But the first two things he wants to do is repeal the things that, for example, if you hold a protest and it eventually hurts the profits of a company, you can now go protest again and not worry about it. Well, I think that's a very good thing. And, and, and thank goodness Canada is breaking back into freedom after the tyranny they've been through. We just need to accomplish the same thing here in the United States. Well, Justin doesn't forget it was his father who re repatriated the Canadian Constitution and instituted the Bill of Rights. So before the 70s, you didn't have the right to remain silent when you were arrested. Well, good for uh, good for uh, Trudeau II. And, uh, and again, we need that kind of thinking here in the U.S. And I think we're going to get it from Trump. Uh, we may be getting it from Sanders as well. Uh, the, the, the outsiders in this campaign do seem to be listening uh, to the concerns of the American people over the invasions of privacy, uh, the fact that we now have torture centers inside the United States of America being used by the police to beat confessions out of people so they can throw them in prison. And that is certainly unconstitutional. And clearly we have a federal government that has gone off the constitutional reservation. 
And my opinion, and it's shared by a lot of other people, the only legal, legitimate government of this land is one that stays within the restrictions placed on it by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. That's the original contract with America. And any government that is operating outside of that is no longer a legitimate government of this land. They're an occupying power. And certainly from Benjamin Netanyahu's point of view, it's an occupying government to serve Israel at the expense of America. We'll have more with Michael Rivero right after the break. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. In Goddard We Trust. Welcome back. We're speaking with Michael Rivero, editor and founder of WhatReallyHappened.com. Switzerland has just elected an anti-immigration government. Can you see that happening more often now? Yes, I can, uh, but we're starting to see a very alarming trend within the EU as a whole of the existing government simply blocking uh, elected officials uh, from taking office on the basis of their views. Um, Poland, uh, uh, I'm sorry, was it Poland or Romania? Uh, either one I'm forgetting, but here's the point of view. Uh, they just had elections and a bunch of anti-austerity, anti-EU politicians won, and the existing government simply declared by imperial edict, you will not be allowed to take your offices because you don't believe the way we do. You also warn that, uh, well, what I've noticed is the terminology is changing. They're no longer calling the refugees in Europe refugees. They're calling them migrants. And uh, on your website, you say this is a trend we're going to see for the long run, not short run. Well, if you... Consider that it takes two to three months for somebody to walk from Syria uh, up to Europe. Uh, there is a long, huge population in the pipeline, so to speak. So, no, it's not going to go away. And I think the reason the uh, migrants were being encouraged to go to Europe is the same reason we're being encouraged to allow the illegal immigrants into our country. And it all goes back to a statement made by an official at the United Nations a week ago that national borders are imaginary and should be dispensed with which reveals the agenda to try and create this one world government. And in order to make that easier, they have to destroy our sense of regional cultural identity. That's the reason the Confederate flag is an attack down here. It's the reason the founding fathers are under attack here. Uh, there, there was a school in Arizona that has now banned the wearing of anything with any USA logo or American flag because it's going to make the I- immigrants and refugees feel bad. And They want to erase our sense of being Americans or British or Italian or whatever to make it easier to convince us we're just part of this one giant global mass of workers to support this incredibly fascist dictatorship and their global central bank. Your website says U.S. politicians think poverty is now the new middle class, is it? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, the reality is that most of our, you know, the majority of Americans are now making less than $30,000 a year. But even in its heyday, much of the middle class was an illusion because these people's elevated lifestyles were not based on accumulated wealth, but on accumulated debt. And in many cases, it really was an illusion. These people didn't actually own the lifestyle they were living. Uh, they were having to make payments on it. Uh, and Of course, we understand throughout history, every tyrannical dictatorship wants to get rid of the middle class because it is from the middle class that opposition to oligarchy is going to rise. That was certainly true in the French Revolution, was certainly true in the American Revolution. And so any dictatorship tries to get rid of that middle class because if you have money, you have power. And if you have no money, you are powerless, which is exactly where the tyrant wants you. What's the update on the Fukushima meltdown? The uh, update on the Fukushima meltdown is uh, things got stirred around by a recent storm that went across the site. Uh, the Japanese government and TEPCO are finally hemming and hawing and admitting that, yes, Fukushima was as bad as people thought it was when it first happened. Uh, and uh, everything they said before about, oh, it's safe, radiation's good for you, was just more lies to try and save the malefactors from, from uh, having to be answerable for their poor decision. Uh, we know that safety systems were shortchanged at Fukushima. In fact, um, there's an interesting story about the power station in Onagawa because their engineer in charge of building their safety systems fought a one-man battle to not let 
anything be cut back, not let the uh, tsunami walls be shortened, to make sure that emergency generators were up off the ground, protected from tsunami. And uh, unfortunately, he did not leave, uh, live to see the vindication of his decisions, but that power station at Onagawa was the only one not damaged by the quake and tsunami. Up and down the coast, they all suffered damage to a uh, greater and lesser degrees, with the worst being at Fukushima. There is uncontrollable fission taking place deep in the earth underneath the ruins. It's going to be 200 years before anybody can even get close to, to that reactor site and deal with it. Well, of course, the, the most famous meltdown before that was Chernobyl that happened in the 80s, and now what's Ukraine? They have tourists that go in there, but you have a, a radiation badge, so you know if you dip in for an hour or two, you're probably okay. But nobody lives there, and they don't expect anybody to live there either for another you know 200 years. Well, I think this idea of having tourists go through Chernobyl is more of a propaganda device to try and convince everybody the problem is over. And yes, if you go into Chernobyl for a short interval of time, you'll be okay, unless you inhale or ingest something that's an isotope. And they've had a real problem lately with uh, wildfires burning up the plants that had absorbed much of that radioactivity and putting it back into the air as soot and cinders. And I certainly would not take a tour of Chernobyl. Uh, and, and, and again, it's a PR stunt. Uh, the way the U.S. government encouraged Hollywood to film the John Wayne movie The Conqueror at the nuclear bomb test site to prove that it was really safe and you, you could all go there and you didn't need to worry. And half of the production crew, uh, including John Wayne, came down with cancer from that. Uh, they had brought back truckloads of the soil for the interior sets and they wound up having to tear down the soundstage and bury it. It was so heavily contaminated. And so governments will tend to do these things to try and reassure everybody that everything is really okay uh, I certainly wouldn't trust it. I wouldn't take a tour through Chernobyl. I wouldn't take a tour through Fukushima. Uh, and, and, of course, we have two more radiological uh, disasters taking place in the U.S. There's an underground fire at a landfill in St. Louis that's about 300 meters away from an old radioactive waste disposal site left over from the U.S. early bomb making. And there's another radioactive waste site out in Nevada that seems to have spontaneously burst into flame. And, of course, we haven't seen that on the nightly news, have we? No, and you won't. And, as a matter of fact, the EPA just announced that the vast majority of the radiation detectors and the nationwide network that's supposed to watch out for these things have now been shut off. Or they were obsolete and didn't do a good job. Well, Or is that the story point, they're giving us? At this point, if anybody's living in Nevada or uh, in, near St. Louis, I would definitely invest in a radiation meter, uh, meter right now. Is there anything new with the GMO issue in Hawaii? Uh, unfortunately, the uh, judge in the case in Maui uh, has left uh, you know, the, the injunction in place against implementation of the anti-GMO bill that was voted through, saying that we're going to wait till the state legislature looks at it, which is going to be the start of next year. In any event, it may be moot because Monsanto has managed to bribe enough members of Congress to get a bill passed banning GMO labeling and banning GMOs, uh, and it's going to the Senate. It's expected to pass there, and Obama is expected to pass it. It's amazing. Uh, w there are 70 countries around the world that ban GMOs. Uh, there's another uh, 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 30 that allow GMOs but mandate labeling. But here in the United States of America, we're being told you are not allowed to know if these dangerous proteins, dangerous genetic material, dangerous chemicals are in your food. You don't need to know that. Just spend your money and keep America green. Is there any positive news out there, Michael? Well, the positive news is overall in general in that the entrenched economic political system is clearly starting to fragment. Uh, I think a good illustration of that uh, would be uh, 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 Netanyahu uh, and uh, uh, Israel chastised MSNBC for showing a map of Palestinian land loss to Israel over the years, and we had to applaud MSNBC for their courage. They were attacked by all these pro-Israel groups saying the map is inaccurate because there's no such thing as Palestine, which has been a constant propaganda theme going all the way back to Golda my year. There's really no such thing as Palestine, no such thing as Palestinian people. It's just a lie to make Israel look bad. Then one week later, after they use there is no Palestine to silence MSNBC, Netanyahu comes out and says, yeah, there is a Palestine. They're responsible for the Holocaust, which makes Netanyahu a Holocaust revisionist, which I think under Canadian law means he can be arrested. Very interesting. Michael, thank you very much for chatting with us. Thank you for having me.
My guest has been Michael Rivero, editor and founder of WhatReallyHappened.com. You're listening to the Goddard Report on TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our popular YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Comments about the show can be emailed to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.